Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would give me just a moment so I could thank the individuals that chose the genre for this compilation. Samantha, Susan, Tina, Kimberly, Patty's niece, Denise, Cindy, Jessica, Lisa, Jean, and Sophie. Thank you all so much for responding to the community tab that I set up for this. If this all takes off, this will be a monthly thing. If you are new here or you haven't done so already, please remember to hit that subscribe button and tickle the bell right next to it and set it to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. All right. I put out part one yesterday and everyone seemed to love it. So today will be part two. I think it can fit all into one. I'm not sure. But if not, there'll be a part three regardless. Anyway, let me shut up so you all can get your rest and we can get this vocal melatonin running. Cool? All right. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to gift me a copy as a special thank you, that information can be found down below in the description box. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Terrifying Scary Stories Compilation Part 2. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Before I read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Here are the rules to survive the game. Number one, if you are seeing this in your mailbox, you have been chosen. It's not addressed to you. Refer to rule two and all related ones. You cannot escape it. You better prepare fast. In this case, refer down to rule three and read from there. Number two, it only targets each person once. If this letter was addressed to someone else at the residence, you are safe. For now, it targets one at a time. 2A. If it is addressed to someone else, give this to them. Go to sleep as normal. Just know you are safe. Q. Only do this if you are referred to this rule. Return to the starting room and do these things in exactly this order. It will not work if you did not do something wrong. QA. Stand with your back to the door of the starting room. Take five steps forward, spin around, then place the meat in front of the door. Use the knife to make a cut in your left palm and get as much blood as you can on the floor. Leave all of your supplies with the meat and bandage up your palm and then try to write this exactly in the blood. Redacted as this is in symbolized words, which I don't know what it means. If done correctly in a circumstance, you needed to do it. You should hear a ding. If you don't, fias there. Number three, since you've been chosen, make sure to open everything in the house. 3A, pick a room and close everything in it. This is to be referred to as the starting room from this point on, and you shouldn't have anything alive in there other than yourself. Number four, make sure to keep a weapon in the starting room in case things go south. Preferably a silent one if anyone else lives nearby or with you. 4A. More things you will want are a light source, plenty of batteries, some raw meat, a knife if that was not your chosen weapon, some bandages, and something to do. 4AA. Leave the weapon out. You can trust me. I won't hurt you. Number five. At midnight, you must be in the starting room. 5A. If you are not, you lost before it started. You didn't stand a chance. Refer to roll Q if you can get to the chosen starting room in time. If you do not prepare, one Fias has won. You will die 
horribly by Fias's hand. Number six, you will need to wait in the starting room for one hour. You may not use electrical outlets during this time. At 1 a.m., proceed with the next step. 6a, if you use an electrical outlet, you will attract FEM. Your starting room will no longer be safe. Grab everything you have except for the meat and move to a smaller room. Get everything closed in that room by 1 a.m. It is your new starting room. Stay there until 2 a.m. and skip to step 8. 6b. You may not use any light past this point except for the light source you chose to bring. If you were dumb enough to choose the lights that you use a light switch for in your house, you will be doing this with no light at all. The electricity attracts FEM. Number 7. When you may proceed, close everything in the room immediately outside your starting room. You have 30 minutes to do so. 7a. If you fail to close it at all by 1.30 a.m., refer to Rule Q. 7b. Once you close everything and hear a ding, return to your starting room. 8. At 2 a.m., unless your starting room is the kitchen, go there. Open the fridge, then return to the starting room. 8a. If your starting room is the kitchen, grab some form of meat or leftover meat and go leave it in the bathroom. 8b. If you referred to Rule 8a and didn't have something out of the fridge to give a film, try the freezer. If there's no meat there, refer to Rule Q. 8c. You must be back in the starting room by 2.30 a.m. or Fiam will eat you along with his meal. 9. Once you are back in the starting room, wait there until 3 a.m. 10. At 3 a.m., Fiam is hunting you. Your only goal is to avoid Fiam until sunrise. If you choose to stay in the starting room, you must venture out at 4 and 5 to leave half of the meat in the same place you left its snack earlier. The halves can be approximate as long as the full amount of meat is eventually gone. 10a. If Fiam finds you, try and refer to Rule Q. It's your only chance. And finally, number 11. At sunrise, congratulations, you survived. You will be rewarded with immunity from sickness for a decade. You will not be targeted again. My father had been dating this girl for a while, and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along great with my sister and I. Eventually, my father asked her to move in with us. She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were great for the first two months until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for an interview before she even moved in. She moved in on July 2nd. She didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school and with no experience in a job setting, was able to get a job before she was. This caused my father to have to cover her car payments and insurance. This set us back financially, but we were okay. Then October came, when the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared, all taking place when after my father and her were dating, and all while she was still living in her hometown. These text messages were laced with him coming over and giving her nighttime lovin's and inappropriate pictures. My father confronted her about it, and she denied it, saying we just didn't understand her friendships. My father let it go, as they haven't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up, and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go buy cigarettes. 
This may only sound like a small amount, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. These arguments mainly consist of her lying about something and not admitting to it, and her doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got worse as Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore. He didn't have any feelings towards her and that she needed to work to fix the friendship if she wanted to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid shit. She agreed that she would. I advised him against giving her the option. I was tired of her shit too and wanted her out. She started lying more and more and causing more problems. We believed she started taking some sort of drug as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out, spouting nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments to which my father responded, Pack your shit and get the fuck out. How dare you go after my kids, you bitch? Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to everyone in the household, especially my father, reducing him to tears when he found out that she had been receiving $1,000 a month from her mother, which would have had us staying up to date on rent payments. We have no idea what she did with the money. No matter the situation, she would try to twist it so she would be the victim. Even calling my father, asking second opinions, the party of prosecuting Martha. Nothing is ever her fault, and it's always a misunderstanding. Then, she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cat's like sleeping in my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night before because of her. She's drove recklessly with my little sister and I in the car before, and I told my father what had happened. When my father confronted her on it, she said that I was over-exaggerating. The driving in the dark freaks her out. That my sister and I, in our it's too early for this, I'm going to sleep and listen to my earbuds, state was stressing her out a minor thing but she endangered my sisters and my own cats we have two strictly indoor cats and her two were outdoor cats until she moved in her cats have taught mine how to sneak out of the house when the front door isn't latched she leaves the front door wide open constantly when she comes back in from smoking and lets my cats get out we live right across the street from a huge lot of desert, and we hear the coyotes every night. She's let them go out at night before. After she finally got a job, she didn't want to contribute her fair share of the bills. My father asked her for half of her paycheck every two weeks. She claimed that it should only be 25% because there are four people in the house. My sister and I only... We're there on the weekends as we go to school outside of town, which is about an hour away, and stay with other family during the week. She also apparently wasn't paying her car payments after she got her job, as she got a repossession notice, which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, Endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cat, and many other things. My father gave her two weeks notice to get the hell out. She moved out a couple of days ago. She originally left her cats, but failed to pay my father the $350 she owed him. So, she said that we would be taking care of her cats until he got the money to her. She flipped and bursted into the house when I was there alone, saying horrible things about my father and that her babies weren't safe here. When I called her out for not paying the money and everything mentioned above, she told me that I was 
sipping the fucking Kool-Aid. I wished I were joking. I finally shut the door to my bedroom and started sobbing because I couldn't handle this anymore. She came after me by banging on my bedroom door and saying how horrible I was and saying I just slammed my door in her face. I called my father on my phone on FaceTime and opened up my bedroom door and she bolted into the garage. I followed her while my father screamed at her to give me her key to the house. She ran past me screaming nonsense and went back into the living room. I finally had enough, and with my dad on the phone, I let her have it. I was yelling and screaming and cussing. I was just mad, and there was just nothing for me to lose at this point. I finally told her to get the fuck out of my house. She grabbed her cat by the scruff and ran out of the house. I worry for those cats every day. I loved them dearly, and they became such huge parts of our family. I hope nothing but the best comfy, loving lives for them, and the most painful existence for that bitch. These will be 13 creepy superstitions and their origins. Even if you don't consider yourself superstitious, there's a good chance that superstitious beliefs have still worked their way into your life. For example, maybe you try to improve your luck by knocking on wood or picking up pennies, but when it comes to creepy superstitions, these mild practices pale in comparison to the scary things people around the world believe can happen when you defy a superstition. Have you ever wondered where superstitious beliefs originated? Well, we've done the work for you, and you don't even have to cross your finger, clutch a rabbit's foot, or throw salt over your shoulder to explore the origins of these 13 creepy superstitions. Number 1. The number 13 is unlucky. At least 10% of the U.S. population fears Friday the 13th, or the number 13, when it comes to dates for weddings, travel, and other occasions. In fact, some high-rise buildings don't contain a 13th floor, according to History.com. Some theorists speculate that the fear of 13 stems from Judas Iscariot's arrival on the 13th guest at the Lord's Supper. Others pin the superstition to the ancient Norse god, Loki who arrived as the 13th guest at a dinner party, upsetting the other gods and introducing evil and turmoil into the world. However, origin may go back even further to the preference in some ancient civilizations for the use of the perfect number 12 in calendars and measurements, casting a shadow over the less auspicious number 13. Number 2. Breaking a mirror brings seven years of bad luck. You may know that breaking a mirror doesn't really bring bad luck, but wouldn't it make you at least a little nervous if a mirror falls from your walls and shatters? This old superstition originated with the Romans, who believed that our soul could be seen in a mirror. They believed that damaging the mirror would damage the soul for seven years. Another Roman origin is the belief of our soul's renews every seven years. So, if you break a mirror, your soul receives a seven-year sentence of bad luck. Number three, don't place two mirrors facing each other. Keeping with the theme of mirror-related superstitions, there's another creepy tale around the placement of mirrors in your home. According to Mexican legend, putting two mirrors opposite each other creates a portal for the devil to enter your house. Might be something to keep in mind next time you're thinking of redecorating. Number 4. Walking under a ladder draws misfortune. This superstition originated with the ancient Egyptians, who believed that triangles were sacred because they signified the trinity of the gods. So, someone passing through a triangle desecrated the gods, inviting misfortune. Another theory is that criminals sentenced to hanging had to climb a ladder to the gallows, and then the spirit had to descend the ladder after dying, leaving the 
person's lingering restless soul lurking behind the ladder. Number five, tuck your thumbs in at a cemetery. Nothing raises old, creepy superstitions from the dead like wandering around a cemetery. And if you're attending a graveside service or standing near a funeral procession, you might want to take a few extra precautions. That's according to the Japanese superstition of tucking your thumbs into your fist to protect your parents from death since oyayubi in Japanese means parent, oya, and finger, yubi, hence the parental thumb. Number six, opening an umbrella inside brings bad luck. This common superstition has origins raging from practical to downright supernatural. One theory ties it back to the 18th century when the first modern umbrellas were invented. These early iterations had sharp metal spokes and quick springing mechanisms, both of which could cause injury if opening in a small space. So, the superstition could have started as a practical safety warning from modern umbrella owners. However, another origin traces it back to the ancient Egyptians, who had a more spiritual take on it. Ancient Egyptians mainly used umbrellas to shield themselves from the sun. Therefore, opening an umbrella indoors and away from the sun was viewed as an insult to the sun god who might then take revenge on the whole household. Number seven, don't trim your nails after sundown. You may want to cancel next week's evening pedicure once you read the article of this superstition. In Turkey and India, there is a superstition that cutting your nails after sunset will bring bad luck. Japan takes that creepy superstition seriously, warning that trimming your nails at night can cause premature death. But the Koreans go all out, believing that discarded clippings will be eaten by rats who morph into monsters to terrorize you as you sleep. In other words, you might want to consider trimming those toenails on a Sunday afternoon instead. Number 8. Singing at the dinner table summons evil spirits. Next time you feel like breaking out into a song over the mashed potatoes, you may want to hold off until you leave the table. Otherwise, you could attract evil spirits, according to a Dutch superstition that's also common in Bohemia and North Carolina. The origins of how this belief came about are uncertain, although some speculate that someone may have wanted to silence a dinner mate with a less than melodious voice. Number nine, whistling attracts tragedy. If you're one of those lucky people who just can't get the whistling thing down, you may be luckier than you think. In Turkey, there's a superstition that whistling at night summons the devil. In Estonia and Latvia, the superstition takes a different twist. There, they believe that whistling indoors can bring bad luck causing the house to burst into flames. Some Russians believe that whistling can cause financial ruin. So, next time you feel like whistling the day, or even worse, the night, away, maybe hum a few bars instead. Number 10. A black cat crossing your path is unlucky. The ancient Egyptians revered cats, linking the sleek companions with deities, women, and a prominent place in the household. Cats toppled from their revered pedestals around the 13th century. However, when Pope Gregory IX issued a warning against having or associating with cats, he betrayed the felines as Lucifer in disguise cavorting with witches to place curses while purring beside a bubbling witch's cauldron. I'm sorry, before I move on, I have a black cat, and she's amazing. She wards off spirits, and she owns my soul. I think the rest of you that have a black cat would agree. Number 11. Don't chew gum at night. Many people like chewing gum, but you may want to think twice about the time of day you decide to enjoy a piece. That's because, according to a Turkish superstition, when a person chews gum at night, the gum transform into the flesh of the dead. So next time you're thinking about popping a stick of gum after dark, 
you may want to hold off until the morning. Number 12. Hold your breath when you pass the cemetery. You might want to hold that practicing deep breathing when you pass the cemetery on the way to work. That's a good way to get grounded. But you might also inhale an evil force or a recently departed spirit looking to take up residence in your body, according to an old superstition with origins in the South. The superstition which advises holding your breath when passing a cemetery is still common today in some southern states. And lastly, number 13, never rock an empty chair. You might be tempted to rock that empty rocking chair just for the hell of it. If you do rock an empty chair, however, you may as well hop right onto it and rock to your heart's content with the evil spirit you just invited into your life. That's according to another southern superstition. In a different version, standing up from a rocking chair that you allow to keep moving ensures that you will get sick within the next year. The first time I heard about the dark web, I was in high school. The very idea of a secretive network within the internet seemed very inviting to the 13-year-old me. I've always had a knack for computer science, so when I first heard about it, it was only logical for me to seek it out. But that was 10 years ago, and the internet was still very primitive. Resources for self-tutoring were also limited, and thereafter, no matter how tempting it was for me to discover this trove of hidden treasures, it took me a while to figure out. I remember the first time I went online on tour, almost giddy from excitement of exploring the unknown. I navigated to the hidden wiki page with its extensive link catalog. I visited some online gun and drug stores and called it a day. Exciting, but nothing out of the ordinary. But things got messy the next time I opened Tor. I came upon an anonymous chat site that anyone could use by signing up. The guys there seemed really nice. I told them I was new to the whole Tor thing, and they took their time to explain me the basics and how everything worked around that network. Take it easy, one of them typed back. So, what are you looking for? I've been hearing stories about the dark web, so I came to check it out and see what all the fuss was about, but it's all pretty mellow, I responded. I guess I was expecting some surprises, but drugs and guns are all that's here. I had given my honest opinion. You're a nice chap. If you like surprises, follow this link. He then typed, and he signed out. The link took me to a private forum, sort of like Reddit, but more basic. The first thread was an extensive discussion on how to make cocaine from locally available substances. It also talked about different and other unconventional types of highs, like injecting oneself with a mixture of chlorazalanol and ground sugar. A user reported that the high was so potent 12 hours later he was still reeling. Another thread discussed the best ways to have sex with your pets. As gross as it was, the users also posted links to porn sites that had human-animal sex. I've been looking around for a couple of hours when I came across an innocuous-looking link sitting quietly at the bottom of a section with the subject line, NSFW. At this point, I had already seen a woman have sex with a horse, so there wasn't really much that could surprise me now, or so I thought. The link took me to a video feed of a girl sitting in a chair with a countdown clock running at 11 minutes to zero. The girl looked sleepy, possibly drugged, as she looked right at the camera, eyes half open. I had no idea what was going on. The website was minimalist, just a 
comment bar and no other frills. I tried typing something, but the website told me that I was a guest and to leave a comment. I had to sign up and pay about $50. Five minutes to zero, a man entered the room and started hustling furniture around. The comment section suddenly fired up. They were about 50 other users signed in, and they were all leaving obscene comments. The man came near the monitor, seemed to read something from it, smirked, and went back. It suddenly dawned on me that perhaps this was a live feed. As the countdown clock counted down to zero, Beethoven's Ode to Joy began to play in the background. The man came back on screen, this time with a Swiss army knife. The comment section, in the meantime, was bustling with perverse comments. Tear her shirt down, somebody wrote. And in a moment, I saw the man slash through the girl's shirt, making her partially topless. Spit down her throat, somebody else wrote. And the man did. Suddenly, the quantum of the incident dawned on me. There was this girl who was being tortured live for the viewing pleasure of a bunch of sick human bastards. I almost felt like throwing up. Hit her ribs with a bat was the next request. I watched in horror as the man pulled out a baseball bat from underneath the table, swinging it right for her chest and toppling her over by sheer force of the hit. The girl howled in pain as the commenters typed in their ha-has and loved it once more. She's got a perfect nose, let's break it, somebody typed in. Hey, what happened to waterboarding her, typed another. A chill ran down my spine. Somewhere, there was this girl locked away in a dungeon, possibly abducted from her family to be tortured on a live stream and ultimately be killed at the end of the show. I closed all connections. My hands were still trembling as I proceeded to shut down my computer and take a walk to get some fresh air. It remains to be one of the most unpleasant memories I can still hear her scream in my head as I type this sentence. I still have Tor on my computer, but do not use the service anymore. I just figured I was happy without it. I used to drive for Papa John's. I have several stories. So one day I ended up with this delivery on the evening shift and it was after the dinner rush as far as I can recall. So things were quieter and not as many people were out and about or on the roads. The customer lived kind of deep in this rundown neighborhood full of single story houses. And when I arrived, literally every single light on the house was off. I walked up to the door, figuring I might as well ring the bell since they ordered it, after all. Maybe they were waiting on it anyway, right? Ring. Nothing. I waited for a bit. Ring. Nothing. At this point, I figured they aren't there or are asleep. So I walk away from the door and was about to call my boss to relay that I might have to bring the pizza back, when almost silently the front door opens up. It's literally so dark inside, it's like a scene from a horror movie, where you can't see anything at all. Two pale, stringy-looking guys came out of the darkness without saying much of anything, and pay me in cash for the pizza, then take it and quietly move back into the dark without ever turning on the light. I felt pretty, I left pretty quickly, as it freaked me out. Was I in danger? I doubt it, but those guys were really creepy. Another time, I had to deliver to this really crappy, run-down, extended-stay motel that I always hated going to, because it was literally the most dangerous place we delivered to. It was very late, 
at around 10 p.m. or midnight, I don't remember. I got out of my car and got the pizza from the trunk. And as I begin to walk across the parking lot to the guy's room, I see that down at the far end of the parking lot are a very large crowd of people. From what I could tell, they look like a gang or just a lot of rough people hanging around. I became really nervous. After I gave the guy his pizza, I took my empty pizza bag and was walking back when I looked left and they were all, keep in mind, this was a crowd of 30 people or so, walking toward my direction. Not a single one of them was walking anywhere else. I very quickly cranked the car and got the hell out of there before I had a chance to figure out what was going on or if they were coming to me specifically. Finally, I delivered to this old guy in the same rundown neighborhood as the first story. I've had his house before, I believe, and his deranged-looking son was the one who usually answered the door. But this time I got pops, and I'll never forget it. He opened the door shirtless, and I was immediately greeted with what looked like a surgical scar. Not too bad, right? It was infested with what looked like warts or skin growths. I don't mean a few either. It was absolutely covered in them to such a point where I can't think about it without getting sick. They were pale looking, but the color of rolled snot. It reminded me of the way sea life latches onto other creatures and grows. It was pretty scarring. He paid in cash and I left as quickly as I could. I remember immediately hitting the hand sanitizer in my car, practically bathing in it. Other than those, we had a few weirdos, but nothing too serious. There was a guy we delivered to whose nickname was Captain Underpants because he always answered the door in his underwear. Gross, but nothing you can do about it. It was an interesting job, to say the least. Oh, yeah, I remembered another one. So we had this massive, sprawling apartment complex that we often had to deliver to, and all the drivers despised and hated it. It had multiple apartment buildings with the same numbers, so it was awful to navigate through, but otherwise new and rather nice. One day, I got this delivery to a guy way in the back of the complex, who we'll call Mr. White. I make my way back there, and as I climb up the steps, I hear this muffled sound coming from the room. I knock, and Mr. White opens the door, looking like Mr. Rogers. He had a sweater and everything, but he was paying for the pizza. I keep hearing muffled, gag-sounding female screams coming from inside his apartment. It did not sound like a TV. It sounded like a person. But this guy just kept on smiling as he paid, acting like nothing was wrong, and not even trying to explain it away as the TV or anything. This dude was chill as ice. He finished paying and took the pizza. And I walked back down, kind of wigging out over what I had just heard. I couldn't be sure it was someone, but I hated to do nothing and someone died because of it. I called my boss on the way back, and he advised I called the police immediately. So I did. They took my name, but I never heard anything about what happened or if the guy was actually doing anything at all to someone in there. But regardless, it freaked me out. Either I called the police on an innocent customer, or I saved someone from a psychopath. I still think about that night, still to this day. I grew up in southern Appalachia, in western North Carolina, 30 minutes outside of the town of Asheville. The hills and hollers of the Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest mountains in the world, with some of the rock formations dating back over a billion years. That quite literally means they were here before terrestrial animals. 
As with most things that have been on this earth a long time, there are inexplicable anomalies, both benevolent and malevolent. For example, the brown mountain lights. Never in my life have I felt threatened or uneasy when witnessing them from Wiseman's view. They're neither good nor evil. They just are. On the benevolent side, sometimes when you walk through an abandoned old church up near mom and dad's property line, you can feel good, warm, and happy energy. It's like that first warm day of summer when the sunshine is not too hot, but it's not too cold. Well, this story is not about one such anomaly. It's about something that was definitely malevolent. About a decade ago, I was in night school up at AB Tech, going to school for automotive mechanics. I go into class at around 2 p.m. after I get off my part-time job, and I would end up getting home at about 10.30 p.m., depending on traffic. Every night I drove the same road, in my old 1973 W200 Dodge pickup. Some nights it would get rather boring and I would take a different route or jump off of I-40 and drive the back roads. On this particular evening, I had decided to just stay on I-40 because I just wanted to go home and go to bed. It was Thursday and there was no class on Friday and I wanted to get in bed early so I could go out into the woods and go hiking early morning, watch the sun come up. As I jumped off of I-40 onto the exit where my parents lived, the night seemed to get darker and none of the animals that I could hear through my rolled down windows made any more noise. The cab of my truck became smaller and smaller and my breathing quickened. I have never faced any kind of anxiety in my life, but at that moment, something felt off and there was no way I could have put my finger on what it was. I came to a stop on the exit ramp, turned to go down the road, and I happened to notice that the gas station off the exit where mom and dad lived had no lights on. They were a 24-hour truck stop and always had lights on, but I didn't think about it again after noticing. I just chalked it up to the power being out, but I could not stop shaking the feeling that something was definitely askew. I slowly shifted through all of my old truck's gears, not wanting to make any more noise than an old pickup already did. I leaned over my steering wheel to look up at the moon through the windshield, and there were barely any stars visible, which was way out of the ordinary. If you've ever been to Appalachia, primarily, the sparsely populated areas where I'm from, you can see the Milky Way on clear nights. An absence of stars back home is only due to cloud over or whatever in the hell went on on this particular night. As I rounded a particularly sharp left-hand curve and chugged through a straight stretch before the next right-hander, I looked at the ancient decaying barn I always gaze at when riding that stretch of road and thought about how long that thing had actually been there and how many advancements in civilization it had seen. For the split second that my gaze wandered, a very large, stickly-looking dog running out in front of my truck, no more than ten feet in front of me. Old Bessie was a good old truck, but she didn't stop very well. Thump, thump. I heard the fence posts I had left in my truck bounce up out of the bed and then went back into it as I slid to a stop. My first thought was, Oh, God, now I have to tell these neighbors that I ran over their dog. That shit doesn't go real far with people around here. It can really kind of set them off depending on the dog and the person. As I sat there breathing into the smell of burning rubber, something else found its way into my nose. The stench of rotting flesh. It's not a smell you ever forget once you smell it one time. I didn't pay much attention to it at that time. 
I just chalked it up to some rotting roadkill nearby. Finally, I thought to myself, let me go check and see who this dog belongs to. I pushed my clutch in, shifted to reverse, and as I looked into the rearview mirror, illuminated by the haunting glow of my reverse lamps, was the same dog. Only it wasn't on four legs anymore. It had stood up like a man, a man well over ten feet tall. Only then did it dawn on me that the front of my truck was every bit of five foot tall, and this dog was every bit of five foot tall at the shoulder on all fours. As it turned its head to look in my direction of my truck, I caught only a glimpse of this creature. It was not a dog. It was not a man. It was somewhere in between, and at that time, entirely separate altogether. Its skin hung loose off of its emaciated and thin frame like a raccoon. Bits of matted fur and dirt and mud clung to its legs like a disease. The right arm seemed a little longer than the left, and they both hung abnormally low. In relation to other animals, this creature seemed to be. As it regained its senses, it turned and looked into the mirror like it knew exactly where I was sitting. The face was that of an old man's, but the very edges of its face seemed to not only totally be defined, they seemed to move and change like something you would see at a cellular level in a scientific documentary. There were no eyes, but only sockets where eyes should have been. No hair, and the skin that was dripping off of its face was a cold, lifeless gray color. The nose was shortened, shoved into its face like a pit bull, but the teeth, the teeth still haunt me. It was definitely carnivorous and true to form of the rest of its unnatural look. Many of the teeth didn't seem to be arranged in a natural way in its mouth. They seemed to fill and spill forth from the indefinable face, almost like they knew the horror that occupied and they were searching for a way out. It stared through my life, into my eyes, and past my soul. It seemed like an eternity, but it could not have been more than five seconds that I sat there paralyzed. A light came on at the house next to the road, causing the creature to snap its gaze in that direction and tear off into the woods on its back two legs like a man. I jammed my old truck into first gear and roasted tires all the way through first, snatched second gear, and drove as fast as I could home. When I got to the house, both of my parents were asleep. I went downstairs into my bedroom and loaded every firearm I possessed and locked all of the doors. I couldn't wake them up. Who the fuck would believe that? And at 10.30 on a Thursday night, the basement was eerily quiet that evening. Even their dogs that got up to raise hell outside and animals in all hours of the night were dead silent. The old post and beam house didn't even creak or pop that night, as was usual. At about 3 a.m., I started to finally get drowsy, and as I went to lay my head down to get some sleep, so I could still attempt to go hiking the next morning, I smelled the stench of death again. It was faint at first, but it was definitely there. I thought to myself, you're just going crazy. None of this shit is real. But as I dwelt on it, it became more and more noticeable until it filled the entire basement. My dad has a home office in the basement with two large glass doors that face Pigsna National Forest, an impenetrable 500,000-acre woods. I finally worked up the courage to walk out of my bedroom and into the basement living room with my little tactile 12-gauge loaded tack light on. I covered the flashlight with my hand so as to not make any presence known until need be and as I turned right out of the living room into my father's office, 
I shined the light through the glass doors, and at the edge of the woods, there stood the creature. It was motionless. It stared right into the light, unafraid, with those soulless sockets devoid of eyes. I quickly covered my tactile light, ran into the living room, flipped on the outdoor floodlights, and to my surprise, it was no longer standing at the edge of the woods. But between the house and the edge of the woods, still motionless, I swung the door open and fired every round I had in its direction. I must have scored a couple of hits because it screeched an unearthly scream like that of a woman being slaughtered as it took off into the woods. The dogs went crazy. Mom and Dad woke up asking me what the hell I was doing. I told them that a bear had gotten into the trash and I was scaring it away. They didn't believe me, but I knew they wouldn't believe in the truth either. I didn't sleep that night or any time until the following Sunday. Everything seemed to return to normal, and I didn't think about the creature again until I met my wife about six years later. Her mother's house sits at the mouth of the holler, no more than four or five miles up the road from my mother and father's house. Up on the side of the holler, there were kennels for her brother's hunting dogs. No longer in use and haven't been in years, but the fence is still there and the concrete pad is still there. It's a thing of great use when you need to quarantine an animal. My great Pyrenees had gotten into a tussle with a raccoon, which of course he destroyed, but his rabies vaccination had lapsed, so we had to keep him quarantined for a while. It didn't bother him. He kind of likes solitude. This particular night that we were coming home from a movie date in a neighboring town was the last night of quarantine for him. So we walked up to the trail using our phone flashlights to get to the kennel. And there he sat, patiently waiting, tail wagging, happy to see us. We put him on a leash and started walking back to the house with him. As we were walking back through the darkness, I started to feel that same feeling I had felt the night I hit the creature in my truck. I didn't say anything so as not to alarm my wife, but then the smell came wafting in on the breeze. She jokingly asked me, My God, what did you eat? <laughs> you stink. <laughs> I half-ass laughed, not being able to fully appreciate the joke for the horrors that raged within my mind. She immediately caught on and asked me what was wrong, to which I could only apply, I'll tell you later. She grew up in the woods and around hunting and things of that nature her whole life, so she knew what I meant. She knew we were being watched by something. When we could see the lights of the house from the trail to the kennel, we heard it. There came barking from the kennel that sounded like the Great Pyrenees we had on a leash next to us. It was a perfect imitation. The Pyrenees as being a guardian dog immediately sensed that something was wrong, and so he turned to face the danger, belting out deep barks and growls in that direction. I don't know if you've ever had to drag a 150-pound dog, but it sucks and is no easy task. I'm six foot tall and 240 pounds, and it was still all I could do to get him back into the house. The barking never ceased the entire time we were running towards the house. In fact, it seemed to grow closer and closer until it seemed it was coming from inside my own head. My mother heard the commotion and flipped the floodlights on as we made it to the fence of the yard, and I caught a glimpse of something coming to a dead stop at the end of where the light reached, wheeling around and tearing off back into the darkness. My wife looked at me and goes, You want to tell me what the fuck that was? To which I replied, yes, let's go inside. I told her the story, and she listened intently, hanging on every word. 
Her family came from a long line of granny witches and other supernatural healers of the Appalachians. So her older sister came over the next morning with some herbs and chance to bless the property and to ward off evil. I suggested we go up to the dog kennels and do the same thing as well. When we got to the kennels, they were completely destroyed. The very concrete foundation was cracked and the chain link fence was torn out of its posts. The dogs' houses were destroyed and the place reeked of the stench that followed the creature. My wife's older sister just went about her business like normal, blessed the place, burnt some herbs, and led us back into the property. When we got in the house, she wheeled about on us suddenly and instructed us very firmly to never go into the woods after dark, not until this thing left me alone. To make a long story short, my wife joined the military and she ended up getting stationed into Delaware. Well, as someone who's lived around fairly large mountains and endless wilderness their entire life, Delaware is pretty terrible. At least that was my thought when we first moved into the middle of a 50,000 plus population city. Fortunately, though, it didn't take us long to find a house in a sleepy little community further south. We purchased the house that moved in with haste. We were both very grateful and glad to be out of the city and into a rural setting again. The land in Delaware seems lifeless in comparison to Appalachia. The sparsely populated woods don't possess any energy that goes one way or the other. The ground doesn't seem to be alive like it is in Appalachia. Having not thought about the creature in a long time, I resumed my staying outside after dark and playing with our dog in our rather large yard that borders a small patch of woods. Well, last night I went outside to play with the dogs and as dark set in, I built a decent sized fire in my fire pit and consumed some good old fashioned Appalachian Mountain cough syrup from a mason jar. And just as the fire was dying down, my American bulldog tore off towards the woods. He has a habit of running off to go on adventures, so my immediate instinct was to chase him down in the yard and tackle him so he could not get away. As I tackled his 110-pound ass to the ground and threw him in a fireman's carry over my shoulder, I heard him begin to bark again, only the bark was not coming from him. The only sound coming from him was deep, rumbling growl a noise I've never heard him make. It was a threatening noise. Something was possibly and definitely wrong. And as I ran with him on my shoulder back to the house, the stench of death began to fill in the air. The two other dogs must have caught wind of what was happening and met me at the back door, which I threw open, slammed shut, locked, and again loaded my firearm. How the hell could this thing had follow us 650 miles up here? As I flipped my floodlights on, at the back side of the house, several of the bushes and small trees at the forest's edge were still shaking like something had just run through them. My dogs went crazy all night, barking and howling and attempting to get out of the windows. I didn't sleep a bit and I don't think I will for a while. I know for sure I won't be in the woods after dark ever again in my life. Not until this thing is gone. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, terrifying, scary story compilations, part two. Part 3 will come out tomorrow. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Mrs. Innerscare, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Ada Smith, Les Crispin, Patty Sneeze, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. 
I'll just keep saying it like I'm a broken record. Thank you all for being the pillars of support for Back to Ashes. For without you and the other subscribers and listeners, I wouldn't have a voice. So thank each and every last one of you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.